Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dee Petri, President and CEO of the Olmstead Network, and welcome all of you to the latest in our ongoing series of programs about Frederick Law Olmstead and the Olmstead Firm. The Olmstead Network is dedicated to championing Olmstead parks and landscapes around the country through advocacy, education, and stewardship. And tonight's program is just one of many, both live and virtual, that we're offering throughout the year. You can find other programs by going to our website, olmstead.org, and visiting the Experience tab. Registration will soon close on our first travel trip to Boston, April 23 to 25, during Olmsted's birthday week. During those three days, we'll visit Olmsted landscapes and meet with some of the top scholars and practitioners in Boston who will examine these places and their current challenges. You'll have the opportunity to visit Fairstead, the Arnold Arboretum, Franklin Park, and Trinity Church, and hear from Ned Friedman, the head of the Arnold Arboretum, Garrett Dash Nelson, who heads the Leventhal Map Center at the Boston Public mm -hmm. Library, and many more. Eight continuing education credits will be offered. Today, we are exploring another very special place, Shelburne Farms in Shelburne, Vermont. In 1886, William Seward Webb enlisted Frederick Law Olmsted to create a country estate from what was then a dozen exhausted farms on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain. Webb was son of the publisher of the New York Courier and Inquirer. He was also husband of Eliza Osgood Vanderbilt, granddaughter of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, and sister of George Washington Vanderbilt, who was then engaged in another important Olmstead project known as Biltmore. Those Olmstead aficionados among us will know that the Olmstead connection with the Vanderbilt family went back to Olmstead's early days on Staten Island, where Olmstead and William Vanderbilt first connected. It's noteworthy that farm, forestry, and parkland engaged the Olmsted design team in both Vermont and in Asheville. We are delighted today to have Alec Webb, president of Shelburne Farms and a member of the Webb family that commissioned Olmsted many years ago, and Megan Camp, chief mission officer, who will talk to us today about the evolution of Shelburne Farms. We'll explore the farm's rich history and its evolution from a Gilded Age agricultural estate to a renowned education nonprofit. Alec and Megan will highlight the ways in which Olmsted's principles are kept alive and how current work is inspired by Olmsted's values of community building, public health, and conservation. In the audience, we welcome Julie Edwards, curator of collections from the farm, and Pat Patricia O'Donnell of Heritage Landscapes, both of whom have been deeply involved in the evolution of this special farm landscape. As is our custom, we'll have about 10 to 12 minutes for questions and answers at the end. Please put them in the chat box or the Q&A, and we'll conclude by 6 p.m. So with that, let me turn it over to Alec. Welcome. We're so delighted to have you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Dee Dee, and thanks for the opportunity for Megan and me to be here today. And thanks for everyone for joining us. And now I have to figure out how to share my presentation here, our presentation. Here we go. So I'm going to start out. Um, uh, from where we are today and take a look back in time um, at where we've come from. And Megan's going to share more about our current work and what we envision as we look to the future. And then we'll have, as Didi said, some time for questions and answers. So in preparing this presentation, we've been feeling a lot of gratitude for the Olmsted Network and everything the network is doing to increase public awareness and appreciation for Olmsted's vision and its enduring and increasingly important value for everyone in this country. The 501c3 organization that Children Farms is today is both an educational idea and an amazingly beautiful place that supports that idea. The farm is one of the iconic landscapes in North America that reflects Olmsted's design approach and social values. The beauty of the landscape of our home campus provides a refuge for our local community and creates a powerful learning environment for all of the programs we offer. We had a lovely former board member who was an English professor who once wrote that Children Farms is at once an idea and a place, an idea that shapes its educational programs, a place that provides a setting in which those programs may thrive. This is the shuttle wagon going over to the farm barn during the summer, and it just there's nothing that gives me more joy than seeing kids um, 
uh, experiencing th this beautiful place. So we're located, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Shelburne Farms, uh, in Shelburne, Vermont, uh, just eight miles uh, south of Burlington, Vermont, uh, which is our big city. And for everything's relative for us, that means about 50,000 people. So that's hardly a city for many of you, I'm sure. Um, and we're just um, a couple miles from Shelburne Museum, which many of you may be familiar with, that was founded by my great aunt, uh, Lecture Webb Havemeyer. Our nonprofit land holding is about 1,400 acres, um, but along with other neighboring private properties, we comprise about a 3,000 acre area that the town's zoning plan designates as a rural, as its rural mixed use and heritage district. Our mission uh, is to inspire and cultivate learning for a sustainable future, and our vision is a healthy and just world rooted in stewardship and community. And the through line for um, all of the work at Children Farms is making the world a better place through transformational learning experiences and innovative sustainability practices. So if we go back a couple million years, the land here was under a glacier of, that was a mile deep. Um, and this slide shows that about 13,000 years ago, as the glacier melted, the Champlain Sea that, for, that, that formed as a result of the melting covered what is Shelburne Farms today. That little green spot is Lone Tree Hill, um, which is at the center of their property. And that was an island, I guess, at that stage of the game. And after the sea drained to the north, there's evidence of early human activity going back about 10,000 years. And Shelburne Farms is located on the unceded homelands of the Winnesuk Band of the Abnaki. And the European settlers that took this land from the Native Americans here started arriving in the 1600s, the town of Shelburne was chartered in 1773, and by the 1800s, there were 32, uh, our council of hires in years, years DD, but 32 farms on Shelburne Point. And my great grandparents, William Seward and Lila Vanderbilt Webb, started purchasing these farms in 1886 to create their agricultural estate. That's the, the, the plan of the, the farms that were on the point. And they engaged architect Robert Henderson Robertson, who brought in Olmsted to consult on the project. And this was Olmsted uh, writing to Charles Elliott saying, we have an interesting private work in a great stock farm for Dr. Webb near Burlington, Vermont, with a magnificent view over Champlain to the Adirondacks. And that quote uh, continued, and he said that I propose a perfectly simple, a, a perfectly simple park or pasture field, a mile long on the lake, half a mile deep, the house looking down over it. And this plan shows Olmsted, Olmsted's concept for organizing the property into areas for farm, forest, and park activities. He laid out roads with graceful curves through the natural topography and created visual relationships to alternately obscure and reveal vistas, creating mystery and surprise in the landscape and framing the magnificent estate buildings. And these design elements are what continue to nourish people's spirits when they come here today. A nursery was established to support a major tree planting effort and Seward and Lila constructed a temporary cottage in 1887 while they started work on their two great horse barns. First is the farm barn, which was completed in 1891, which housed all of the work animals for the estate at that time. And the second was the breeding barn, which was completed after that to house a, a breeding operation to, to breed hackney horses that Dr. Webb was convinced would uh, be make, uh, superior to the Morgan, which didn't go over well in the Vermont community. But anyway, he, he was convinced that the hackney would, would help advance uh, uh, agriculture in the Northeast. There's a shot in the interior. There's just an amazing space uh, inside that barn. And then they, in, by 1899, they decided to um, expand on the, the temporary cottage they had built um, uh, to add on to that uh, a North Wing. And that actually was not in the site that Olmsted proposed. Olmsted had proposed setting the house back 
um, away from the lake, as that quote um, indicated earlier. But they, I guess, fell in love with being right on the water. And once they made that decision, they built the, the last of the major structures, which is the coach barn, um, to house the uh, sleighs and, and carriages for the estate. And the the, the carriages are now at the Shelby Museum. They're one of the, the first um, collections that, that um, Electra uh, took on over there. So after a uh, relatively brief heyday, the property went into a period of decline. Uh, Seward died in 1926 and Lila in 1936. My grandfather Van kept the core of the property intact in, in 1952. He and my father decided to abandon the idea of maintaining the main original estate structures and to invest instead uh, in Shelburne Farms as a working farm, constructing a new dairy barn in 1952, which was the year I was born. And they built it right in the middle of the golf course that, that uh, Seward and Lila had, had originally built. I think it was this maybe the second or third golf course in the country. Um, so I think this may be the only golf course that's been converted to a working farm rather than the other way around. Um, so that's something of interest. And the dairy barn uh, operation continues today, producing the milk that goes into our farmhouse cheddar cheese. That's, that's part of one of the enterprises that helps support the whole operation here. So my father inherited the property in 1956, and my parents had six children, so I have one, I'm one of six. Um, we were all young and growing up in the 1960s. And the idea of using Shelburne Farms for educational purposes was my generation's response to the conditions in the world, this country, and Vermont at that time. The Vietnam War was tearing the country apart. Uh, my oldest brother uh, served uh, over there. It was a time of questioning uh, America's use of its power and its role in the world. Martin Luther King was mobilizing people across the country to advocate for civil rights and social justice. The environmental movement was gaining momentum with the first Earth Day in 1970. And development designed around the automobile was a part of a growing fossil fuel-based economy, breaking down the integrity of city and village centers, converting prime farmland <clears throat> into commercial strip development and creating a food system and other economic activities with serious environmental and social impacts. And there was the growing threat that children farms would succumb to the pressures of private suburban development as the Burlington area continued to grow. I didn't realize that was all in. <laughs> this is an old chart. We incorporated children Farms resources in 1972 with the goal of making a positive difference in the world beyond this particular place, helping transform how our society lives and learns in relationship to the land and each other. We were young and naive, and the nonprofit had no assets, just a dream, the seed of an idea that was taking root through the 1970s. And in 1984, uh, my father died unexpectedly at, at age 70. Um, and bequeathed the property to the nonprofit following his death at, at the request of all of his kids. And while his gift provided the huge opportunity of saving Shelburne Farms from development and for transforming it for new uses, it also came with a whole set of challenges, including the fact that it was starting with no endowment, had a significant operating deficit, along with a collection of massive historic buildings that were close to going beyond the point of possible repair as a result of years of deferred maintenance. But following the gift of the property, the board, staff, volunteers, consultants, and other friends and supporters began the process of developing education and community programs while at the same time creating new sources of operating revenue and starting the process of rehabilitating the property for its new use. Given the dire financial situation, the board at that time adopted a two-track plan for survival and raising needed capital. The sale of four private house sites and long-term leases and the second track was launching a what we called at that time the centennial campaign which is the farm's first organized effort to reach out to the community for financial support building on the experience of the uh, summer camps and school field trips that um, had started through the early years of the nonprofit in the 70s the initial um, 
a project funded by the campaign was publishing uh, our initial edition of Project Seasons in 1986 as a resource for educators interested in offering hands-on farm and nature-based learning experiences in their schools and communities. That same year, the cottage at the entrance to the property was rehabilitated into our Welcome Center and Farm store to open the farm for visitors. And when I was talking about deferred maintenance, I was I don't think I was overstating that. Uh, as you can see on the back on the this portion of the end. So in 1987, the Shelburne House was rehabilitated. The Shelburne House being the, the Webb's original main house, was rehabilitated into the Shelburne Farms Inn to open the building to the public and create an important uh, new source of revenue. And from the 1980s to today, the, the formal flower gardens have undergone a close to miraculous transformation as well. The coach barn had been used for livestock housing through the 1960s and was cleaned up so we could start hosting education programs and community, and community events there. And the next project was saving the farm barn, which included opening the McClure Education Center in the North Wing in 1993, and our children's farm yard in the South Wing. And today the barn also houses our cheese making, O'Bread Bakery, Beacon Parsons Woodshop and the farm's administrative offices. In 1994, we collaborated with Shelburne Museum and neighboring property owners on conserving the southern portion of the original estate including the breeding barn, which has turned into our ongoing cathedral-like rehabilitation project. We received early support from the, the Getty Foundation and last year with help from a Save America's Treasures grant or, and our capital campaign donors, we were able to complete the exterior repairs. Of course, the main purpose of these campus improvements is to increase our program capacity, which Megan has been working on over her whole career here at Children Farms. And that includes engaging with collaborative partnerships. And one of our deepest partnerships started with Ralph Diamant and Nora Mitchell at, at the National Park Service. And I know the network has sponsored a presentation from Ralph and, and Ethan Carr in their important book, um, Olmstead and Yosemite, Civil War, Abolition and the National Park Idea. Through the Park Service, we were introduced to Patricia O'Donnell and her team at Heritage Landscapes, who developed our first Master Landscape Stewardship Plan, which continues to inform and guide our landscape rehabilitation work. In 2001, our relationship with the National Park Service deepened through the designation of Shelburne Farms as a National Historic Landmark District, with both Robertson's buildings and Olmstead's uh, landscape design contributing to that designation. And a, a kind of my last note as we come back to the present is that through our current uh, capital campaign, amazingly, we've, we've been able to buy back house sites that uh, had been sold in the 1980s to help uh, get the whole endeavor started. And this area in the heart of the farm will now be permanently available for everyone to enjoy through the expansion of our walking trail network. And I think Olmstead would be very happy with that. So. With that, I'm going to hand over to Megan. Thank you. We decided not to take another chance at screen sharing, so <laughs> we're just doing uh, uh, chair sharing. <laughs> so. Right. So um, Alec had said I had uh, spent many years here at Children Farms. Um, I was really lucky to join Children Farms in 1982. So that was back um, at a time when the land was still privately owned and the organization had a big vision. And I'm excited to say that last year, well, the year before last in 2022, we celebrated our 50th anniversary as a nonprofit. And so like uh, many nonprofits, we rolled up our sleeves and began to take a look at our strategic plan and the refresh um, that was needed um, to be relevant in the world that we work today. 
So at Shelburne Farms, as Alex described, um, we are committed to having the greatest impact that we can through our learning experiences and programs. Um, and we'll talk more about how we are committed to building a global network of collaborators and deep, deeply believe in uh, collective impact and partnerships. And then we also have this incredible 1400 acre campus as a working farm and all of the um, activities that are here, the farm related activities, help enhance our education programs in helping us to make connections to the land. But the place is also a really, um, is really our platform for everything that we do. And we're really committed to welcoming people to enjoy the property and explore almost every idea of sustainability, which we call the big ideas of sustainability on this campus. We had four goals that came out of our strategic plan. Um, one, which is we have continually um, are committed to doing through our programs is to deepen the impact of Shelburne Farms. Um, also are an important um, initiatives to try to, which we've been able to over the last um, few years with an increased uh, visitation is intentionally build a culture and an environment that's inclusive and equitable and creates a sense of belonging for everyone. And like every other um, organization is asking that big question of one of the most urgent issues of our times is what is our organizational role in implementing initiatives to help address climate change? And we can do that here through both of our um, on-site um, initiatives on the campus, as well as through our education programs. We have, as, I, as um, Alex said, last um, year was able to um, conserve additional parts of the property and expand the walking trails. So it's just an overview of the over 10 miles of trails that we have. On the campus, we have a chance to inspire learning for sustainability. We have formal education programs that follow more of a curriculum, but we also believe in just the power of experiencing and um, having a chance to be inspired by the land and what goes on on the land. During the pandemic, which many properties um, experienced in public spaces um, around the world, uh, we saw an increase in visitation. Um, we had the chance um, to turn sort of what we refer to as turn down the volume at Shelburne Farms um, so that when visitors came to experience the property, there wasn't as much of the hustle and bustle that takes place on um, a typical day, but could actually have the quietness and solitude and peace to literally even as one this family shared with me when I uh, walked by them as they were watching the sheep intently for like a longest period of time. And they shared with me that they had never stopped to hear the sheep actually grazing on the grass. Shelburne Farms provides a, um, a working landscape and as Olmsted in his original design, designed park, forest, and farm. So the forest is a very important part of, of Shelburne Farms. For those of you who have never seen it, this is our working sugar bush. Um, a sugar bush is where we um, collect the sap. And today we actually had probably 500 people here for an open maple sugar house. Uh, that happens throughout Vermont at this time of year. Shelburne Farms provided a place not only of quiet, reflection, solitude, but also a place of joy. And as we know, and in the spirit of Olmsted, <laughs> um, a place where there was a love of the land. This was a little message that was left behind one day on the walking trails. The 1400 acre campus provides a classroom, but it also provides a really important um, gathering space, um, as Olmsted called sort of democratic spaces for the community to gather. This is our annual harvest festival. We also um, host um, many community events. This is the town of Shelburne's Wednesday night concert series. And we also have many arts um, and 
theatrical performances as well that we host. Shabam Farms offers programs for both adults um, and for community members, but we have a special commitment to youth and work very closely with the local school systems in order to provide that learning experience for mostly elementary, middle, and high school students in the community. This is our farm manager, Sam Dixon, and this is what Alec had mentioned earlier. This could have been, I think this is actually the eighth hole of what would have been the third nine hole golf course. All the experiences at the farm um, are, which we believe the best way of learning is through your senses, uh, through the seasons, and also in a hands-on way. So not only can you get a chance to actually see the cows in the pasture, but you actually get a chance to be a farmer for the day, as you can see with this young group here pushing the silage into the feed alley. So we mentioned today is still sugaring season. We never know exactly what the beginning and end is. It doesn't follow a calendar, uh, but um, this is a, the sugar house with our sugar maker. Um, getting a chance to actually see that sap being boiled off into maple syrup. And of course, the best part of the day is the tasting, <laughs> not only of the sap, but the syrup. We um, have about seven acres of um, organic vegetable production. We also grow fruits and flowers and berries as well. And one of our um, most important programs is something that we refer to, which has become a national movement as Farm to School. It's a chance to connect communities with schools and with local farms. And part of learning about uh, local food systems is also knowing that a healthy food system is not just exploring the cultivated land, but also uh, discovering and with a sense of wonder, uh, our ecological systems as well. So there's always time with a school visit uh, to roll over a log and discover a salamander, to see where the tree frogs live, and of course to explore the life of macroinvertebrates in what's um, a healthy water ecosystem. We work um, with most schools that are within a two mile um, driving distance of Shelburne Farms. The school trips are very popular, um, but of course we can't accommodate every school group that wants to come. Uh, so we also open up the campus to other educational learning organizations. This is a group called Sarah Holbrook. This is a summer camp that in addition to our um, are summer camps that the public can, can roll in. There are also some camps that are organized by organizations. And this is the uh, English language learning summer camp with a program called Sarah Holbrook for New Americans. We also have a long tradition. Um, we've hosted Sarah Holbrook for 20 years of hosting a special summer camp that's provided by our local, um, a local monk and uh, it's for children who are um, of Tibetan um, heritage. So we mentioned uh, learning about where your food comes from is something that happens every day here. The discovery that your food that you eat uh, doesn't come from a grocery store and there's nothing like the discovery of pulling a carrot or discovering almost like a treasure chest of potatoes underground. We're not able to have every group come, as I mentioned earlier, to Shelburne Farms. So we've started a program statewide called Farm to School, which is now um, a national program um, where schools across the country um, are beginning to make connections to local farms for serving food in the cafeterias, but also for providing important learning experience for the students. As part of that, and I think we actually have on this call, a member of the Farm Paced Education Network, we participate in a, a network that was created 15 years ago to help create a learning community of other farms around the country and around actually the world to be able to share peer-to-peer -peer 
ways in which we can continue to connect our communities to the food that's produced in our, on our land. Shelburne Farms, with the idea of thinking about the greatest impact that we can have, has realized that we can work directly with students, but we have a limit in our capacity of how many people we can welcome to the farm or provide in our outreach programs. So 25 years ago, we identified educators as a key audience. This is the Coach Barn, one of the historic buildings on the property uh, with a group of teachers that are gathering. And we're excited that this building, I don't have a before and an after like it, um, but I think Alex showed you one um, earlier that this is now to be um, after renovations this upcoming year, the home for the Shelburne Farms Institute for Sustainable Schools. And the Institute is our hub for all of our organizational um, programs, um, for educators. With educators, um, we have an opportunity to have a greater impact due to that exponential multiplying approach. For every teacher, we have uh, a chance um, for them to impact their students over their lifetime. The word sustainability sometimes causes some um, some questions and curiosity about what do Shelburne Farms mean about sustain by sustainability? And by sustainability, we think about the three E's, um, which is environmental integrity, economic vitality, equity, meaning social equity. And then none of this would happen without the fourth E of education. Oops, I've got one of those too, Alex. <laughs> So Shelburne Farms hosts um, a series of workshops and seminars and year long programs. We've just recently launched a graduate program with the University of Vermont um, and with the certificate program in education for sustainability. So we have about 1500 teachers that we work with a year. About 500 of those gather here at Shelburne Farms. But during the pandemic, it gave us the opportunity uh, which you wouldn't have seen today, but <laughs> to hone our Zoom skills and actually we're able to work with teachers all around the world and around the country. And so still today we do a lot of hybrid learning. It's not only on site, but also online. So um, this year in 2023 marks that we've had about educators representing 40, I should update the slide, 49 slides across the country and also 44 countries around the world. Recently, we were recognized by the United Nations University as being a regional center of expertise in education for sustainability. So we're joining a network of um, international organizations who also have programs committed to the sustainable development goals and to the future. When we think about sustainability, um, it's a global issue, but our strategy and our approach is that it's place-based, that it's appropriate for students to become immersed in their own local communities, and then from there to have a global impact. Recently, we um, have just published, literally hot off the press, but also as we always have hot online on our website, um, a new publication called Learning Locally, Transforming Globally. And this re is a resource for educators um, that helps. And in many ways, I, I, I thought about sharing this uh, resource in particular, because I think it echoes a lot of the values and actions of Frederick Law Olmsted. The idea is that students have the chance to envision what might be a healthy and just future for their, for their community and to think about how they might design or redesign their own communities to be healthier um, and just communities, and that they themselves as, as young people um, have an opportunity to collaborate in partnership with adults to be able to help create and take action towards change. So the program, um, starts at the very beginning with sort of doing an, a, an assessment of the community. Students love this because they actually get to do a report card on their own community. They think about what's the quality of life um, and then do um, a sort of a side-by-side -side, um, 
measurement of how well their community is doing, and then end, end up identifying a project in which they can embark on in partnership with adults to make change. This is a fearsome group of fifth graders from Georgia. Um, who was part of our pilot program for this. Um, the program was historically called Healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Kids, but using the SDGs as a framework internationally, um, we've, we've retitled the program. But this group of fifth graders from Georgia um, did an assessment of their community and identified, especially coming out of the years where there was more outdoor learning at school, that their school grounds needed more than school gardens and a playground, that they also needed outdoor classrooms. And they also wanted to invite the community in and decided that they were going to create a forest pathway. And this reminded me, I just, um, of, as we know, how we've reshaped the landscapes in many of Olmsted's parks. These fearsome fifth graders moved shrubs, moved trees. <laughs> they carried rocks. They uh, moved lumber and continued to shape the earth to create a beautiful park. So here is the most important part, which is I think what we are all doing with our public spaces, um, is to celebrate the hard work. And this is that group of fifth graders celebrating that they have played a role in improving the quality of life in their own community and sharing it as a public space. And so if you'd like to find out more about our programs, um, I invite you all to come to our website. Um, I also wanted to share that that program is now um, that it's available online. You can download all of our materials. And this is a group of uh, students um, who were communicating with the students uh, in Georgia, as well as students from Nepal and students from Vermont about the work that they were doing around their local action projects. So this is the link to our website, um, and I invite you, There's, um, if any of you are educators or no educator, to share more information. And for those of you who are not educators, we have a whole variety of programs that you could come and participate in um, for learners of all ages. So that's my last slide. You can stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So are you both ready for Q&A at this point? We are. In, well, yeah. first, first, let me just say thank you. What a fantastic presentation. And I think what it really brings home for all of us is how foresighted Olmsted was in so many ways, as you pointed out in the course of your presentation, the issues of social justice and equity, health, uh, mental and physical well-being. Uh, it's interesting to think back in the late 19th, early 20th century, these were issues that were really front and center for him. And uh, just wonderful to see how you all have taken that landscape and continued to adapt to current needs but with that uh, through line really of, of those principles that inform so much of Olmsted's design. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I think it's interesting. Uh, sustainability is certainly not a word that Olmsted would have used, but as we've looked at um, some of his work, I think it's a principle he would have fully supported. We've looked at um, the, the Fenway in Boston and much of his work, which is focused on really dealing with natural systems in a creative way and certainly what you all are doing today. So we just want to say thank you so much for all of that. And before we take questions from the audience, I must say I've got to put in a personal advertisement for the Shelburne Farm Cheddar Cheese. <laughs> I highly recommend it. I've sent it to a variety of people. It's great to be able to offer good cheese and good lessons about Olmsted and Shelburne Farms does both. So uh, again, I want to say thank you for for your diversified um, approach to the landscape, which is really uh, wonderful. Now we do, we're starting to get some questions. So let me ask, can you tell us more uh, what a visit to Shelburne Farms looks like for a history buff? Megan, do you wanna take sure. that one? 
<laughs> yes. So, um, so if you're a history buff, um, we invite you to come and stay at the Shelburne Farms Inn, which is the original home of Lila and Dr. Webb. Um, and it gives you an, an opportunity. And what's remarkable about that building is it, it hasn't changed a lot over time. Um, a lot of the original furnishings are there. It hasn't been, as we say, too gussied up. Um, and um, it's a, it's just a lovely place to stay as a guest and then also to enjoy um, the fresh bounty that comes from the farm. We have a farm to table restaurant there as well. And, and but beginning they, in, we, we, excuse me? I was just thinking they've you gone to want to interrupt you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you you want to pull Julie in? Uh, we thinking. also have the formal gardens, uh, the flower gardens, the uh, Lila, which you saw photographs are are also located located there. But we we offer um, May through mid October um, sort of uh, guided experiences on the farm. You know, with many you know self guided experiences using the walking trails, but we have an incredible group of volunteers um, who conduct um, property tours. Uh, Julie coordinates the tours of the house and garden, but we also have a property landscape tour as well. But if, but if you if you come stay at the inn, you might be able to grab Julie. And I don't know if you want to describe this the resources we've got from the archives? Oh, yeah. So another aspect of a visit could include a visit to the archives, which is just under a thousand square feet of space. So we have an amazing collection of Robert Robertson plans and drawings for the buildings and some um, just an amazing collection, a repository for the establishment of this property. So we've got this incredible 130 plus years of great history. Well, and here's another question that's history related. Is there any interest in implementing the Olmsted original idea of the Arboretum Vermontii, which was going to be focusing on native Vermont trees and bushes? Wow. Uh, we, that is not on the, currently on the, the plan. I don't know. If, if Patricia's on the call, whether you want to speak to I that, don't, I don't yeah. think she is, Alex. She, she isn't? Oh, wait. Okay. Oh, yeah. So we're, we, I mean, we are, um, there's just so many projects that we can undertake. And I think, and we just are, we're working on with heritage landscapes, bringing back the, a lot of the, the elements of the landscape that, you know, that, um, the Olmstedian structure, even though some of the plant materials changing, but we have at the moment are, are not trying to bring back the arboretum idea. Well, and I'm curious too, I mean, in terms of your plantings, uh, obviously your, your farm focus, but when you do plant, are they only all natives or do you have a, a mixture? Uh, I know that there's a an ongoing debate in, in the Olmstead world about the uh, uh, being a purist when it comes to native plants versus versus not. Do you all have a philosophy on that when it comes to your landscape? We are trying to stay with native plants as much as possible. And actually, in my kind of looking back show, I didn't share that there was a lot of elms, the, uh, alleys of elms that that all died from Dutch elm disease. And we we have taken we tried some of the new uh, resistant varieties with mixed results over we've lost a few in the last couple of years but the that one shot did show we, we tried a, a, an LA but now we're interplanting with some sycamore um, because we're we're losing some of those the new elm varieties well I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I'll encourage everyone who's on the call to go to our YouTube channel because you will find a a wide array of programs including one by Patricia O'Donnell who's been referenced several times from Heritage Landscapes, where she talks about the challenges of adapting Olmsted landscapes to some of the climatic changes that we're seeing and the loss of, of elms, the loss of, of uh, beaches, and what Olmsted landscapes are doing to try to adapt uh, in light of, of these changes and new trees and new species uh, designed to adapt to the changing climate. So it's it's an ongoing process and one that's a, a very interesting one for so many of our Olmsted landscapes. Do we have 
other questions in our crowd? And are you all open for the season yet? You still haven't quite opened, have you? Uh, well, we're, we never close really, but during but our, our, the summer season opens May 11th, is it May or, yeah, the second weekend in May. And that's when the inn opens as well? The inn opens and their, um, the tour offerings and the Children's Farm Merit opens up seasonally as well. So, yes. But our the, the locals come out and walk all year round. We have our education programs are going year round, of course. Well, it certainly is a place I think we all aspire to go and visit and uh, to learn more about your program and your beautiful site. And I just want to say uh, thank you on behalf of all of us who are here today to hear this. This has been recorded, so we'll be able to let people come back and listen some more and also have a, a special a life for those who weren't able to join us today. And I just want to remind everyone that this is just one of many exciting efforts underway by the Olmstead Network. Please check our national calendar which has an array of important programs. And on April 25, uh, the day before Olmsted's 202nd birthday, we will be hosting a special virtual program live from Fairstead in Brookline. And we will hear from the park superintendent, as well as Olmsted scholars, Rolf Diamant and Lauren Meyer, who will talk to us about the profession of landscape architecture and what has gone on for so many years uh, in Fairstead. And then I want to remind everyone again, please uh, don't forget about the pop-up programs. We have one where we'll be traveling to Seattle's Dunn Gardens on June 21st. So for those of you wanting to plan your vacation, we've got some ready-made opportunities for you. And then last but not least, we have our annual conference, Landscapes of Renewal, planned for September 13 through 15, where we will explore the work of Olmsted, Calvert Vox, and Andrew Jackson Downing. And indeed, there is an urban farm right there that is currently uh, involved with Downing Park, and we'll be uh, talking to the folks there about their efforts uh, to bring farming to the urban community. So uh, at this juncture, I just want to say thank you again to Alec and Megan for your commitment to the land, for your commitment to the Olmsted landscape, and your commitment to education for sustainability. It's immensely exciting to see what you're doing and how you're connecting uh, Olmsted to the current generation. That's something that we work on each and every day. And we are grateful to you both and everyone at Shelburne Farms for what you do. We were honored to have you on our Olmsted Honorary Committee, and it is great to see you again. So we will look forward to connecting in the future, but want to just say thank you again for today's presentation. And thank you to all who have been with us today. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks thank, again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.